Um, meeting to order. Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Uh, Mayor Copeland is absent. Tom Baylor is absent. Kathy Sherman here. Jeff Gard here. Melina Meyer absent. here. Oh, is here. Uh, Ann Schaefer is absent. David Allison here. David Gleason here. That's a quorum of council, and I'll do the planning commission also. Nancy Bird. Here. Mark Hall. Here. Tom McGann. Here. John Bannon. Here. Chris Olin. Here. Trey Losey is absent, and Sarah Trumpley. Here. And that is a quorum of the planning commission as well. This is, this is Ann Schaefer. I'm here. Oh, hi, Ann. Gotcha. Hi, sorry. So this is a city council joint work session with the planning commission um, and we've established a quorum of all I believe in work session topics. And would you like to lead on Kevin through the agenda? Yeah, so uh, we put this work session together because there's been a couple discussions between the council um, amongst the council and amongst the planning commission uh, about concerns around the city's land disposal process mostly related to the noticing process and public outreach when um, properties are going out for requests for proposals or when new properties are changing status from not available to available <clears throat> and so the planning commission has held a series of meetings to discuss the topic amongst themselves uh, come up with some possible ideas that could be integrated into the code uh, to create more consistency. And they wanted to have a discussion amongst the, both the council and the commission to make sure that everyone's on the same page. And if they are, um, <clears throat> to direct staff to uh, work on drafting up some code changes. Okay, thank you. Um, so, if you'd like, I could uh, go through some of the items that were discussed with the Planning Commission and then we could discuss them further um, amongst you guys. Nancy. As Chair of the Planning Commission, I, I, I think I want to say is that we all recognize that we just make recommendations to you on these kinds of issues, but we've had a couple of times where you have not liked what we recommended and so we would like to try to be in better sync with you, I think, is generally, if I can speak for the commission. Um, and one other thing I would say is I read this this afternoon, Kevin, the number one that you're going to go through, maybe it's just me, but grammatically it makes more sense to me and from a previous one we had a comma, not, there was no comma after the first comma there. It, Read, if a piece of property is identified to be made available at or prior to the submittal of a letter of interest, comma, which has not been available for at least one year, adjacent neighbors will be notified of the change. It reads, it, it's difficult for me to read it with the comma there. I don't know whether. Okay, yeah, we could definitely. Uh clarify that number one a little better if it isn't. Um, this obviously wouldn't be the final language if we did move forward with something, but I can understand how the way it is, it's written currently. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know how you guys would like to um, go forward with this discussion. Like I said, um, I can kind of go over some of the ideas that the Planning Commission had uh, come up with in relation to noticing, um, or if you just want to have a more general discussion about the land disposal code, and then we can uh, see where that goes. Does council have any preference one way or the other? I, I guess I was hoping we could um, kind of start at the background information because I had a couple of quick questions about that, and then focus on one through five in the discussion. If that yes. 
I usually say, I've been on the Planning Commission now about, I think I'm in my, I'm in my fourth year, third year, but um, when I first came on, the process that we've been following has been put in place, and so it was interesting to me to see in this background information that it began back in 2012. In the, and I think that prior, my memory as a citizen is that prior to that, there was no one time a year that the Planning Commission reviewed all the maps of the city and made up a list of what lands that the city owns might be available or not available for sale. And um, so we, had, we came up with this system back in almost 10 years ago now and um, it's worked fairly well, I think, over the years, but there are some, some, uh, yeah, some improvements that could be made, particularly as far as the noticing and as far as, as you know, once a year we go through and, and issue these maps and they now, thanks to improvements in web and online stuff, they've been made available to the public that way for five years, four years. I'm looking at some of my other commission members, which have been here longer than me. Um, and I think that's why we're beginning to see more letters of interest on pieces of property that are not available, and then they come up. And there is a process, and as you see in the code, we are required to accept letters of interest from the public um, for any property but it's a matter of trying to figure out a way to make it fair to, if it's listed as not available, and then all of a sudden a letter comes in from somebody and, and we decide, oh yeah, we can make that available. Should we just open it up for two weeks, 30 days, six months? Should we not? Should we only have it one time a year? We've been doing it to make it as, as easy as possible, sort of at any time of year, but we've been trying to make some notice availability, so. Oh. Tom? Yeah, in 2012, it was a once a year uh, review, uh, but to accommodate more people, um, we decided that we would entertain proposals at any time. Um, maybe I could just, I have some questions, and so maybe I could just start too. Um, I was curious as to this first part about um, that it's the city manager. Uh, I know it's in code, and the method of noticing is to the discretion of the city manager or their designee when land is being considered for disposal, and then how it's supposed to be noticed. And the city manager can do it in the form which he deems most likely to inform the public of the proposed disposal. Um, I'm thinking back on my history, and this is where some of the things have fallen down in that some city managers deemed it didn't need to be advertised necessarily really well. Um, but uh, that's just Hopefully there's just good follow-up there. But the other thing I was going to, I think it should be in the newspaper as well as on the city website and on the radio. Um, but I don't, I don't. That was one of the suggestions of the uh, Planning Commission. Yeah. Because I think it could give them to the city's ad um, and just be in there. But. So, okay. Um, I'm ready to march down through the five with some discussion. Anybody else says? Okay. You want to lead us on through? No? Yeah. <laughs> so, the, like we've said so far, the main topic that the Planning Commission discussed was noticing, but mostly noticing when it comes to properties that um, are currently unavailable, um, but are being changed, their status is being changed to available. And um, <clears throat> Right now, if you lived next to a property that is city-owned and is not available, and then became available and started to go through the process, you could potentially never know. 
Um, and so the first one is addressing that. So it's saying that if there is a piece of property that's identified, that someone submits a letter of interest to make available, um, or sorry, either the count the commission or a letter of interest is submitted to make this piece of property available, and it has not been available for at least a year, <clears throat> then adjacent neighbors will be notified of that change. So basically, the first time it's changed from unavailable to available, adjacent neighbors are noticed. Then if a letter of interest comes in, say, it's been available now for two years in a letter of interest, you don't necessarily need to notify them because they've been aware that it's been available. Um, <clears throat> the second one is, I, I don't know if you want to discuss them or you want me to just go through them. Um, well, I just had a quick question on that one. So is that letter to the adjacent neighbors in writing? I'm assuming. It, it could be, yeah. The details of these haven't been worked out. It's more of just the idea of whether that is uh, something that should be required or not. But um, yes, that could be done as a, a letter that's mailed to the registered owner. Any other questions on number one? <coughs> I had a question. Were we going to do like a so far distant type thing? So there wasn't a consensus on that based on the conversation we had, so it hasn't been included. Um, it's done something that could be explored if that's uh, if that's something that it, you know it seems that a majority of the people here are interested in, then that could be um, added in. Um, but it hasn't been included in this list. I'm sorry, could you repeat the comment? Um, my, well, my audio cut out. Uh, I was just wondering if we were going to do like a distance on for notification for neighboring properties. Okay, great. Thank you. Ms. Mayor, yes, I guess I would just speak in favor of, of making it consistent with some of our other notifications. I think it's 300 feet, I want to say, for um, some of the other notifications for required to give neighbors, and so that seems like adjacent or within 300 feet would be what I would propose. My thoughts also. Okay, moving on. Okay, and then the uh, second idea was that um, <clears throat> Um, before it's even considered for disposal, so because the disposal is a two-step process, first it's making it available, then it's choosing a disposal method. The second item would be, if this unavailable property is being requested to be made available, there should be a comment period um, and a decision, to, uh, there should be a comment period just for that decision, instead of doing them back to back, like they've been uh, done currently, where someone submits a letter, there's a vote to make it available, and then there's immediately a vote to dispose of it. Um, so um, that would then give the people either adjacent or within 300 feet or however far and the uh, city at large when the notice goes out time to comment on you know whether or not it should be made available. <clears throat> um, number three, so if during the annual review since the commission looks at the map annually to determine if any properties should be their status it should be changed, um, if during that review of the disposal maps, a decision is made to make available a previously unavailable property. The updated map will be on the agenda of the meeting to be held no sooner than 30 days later before a final decision is made. Um, so that just kind of tacks on to number two. So it's just um, putting more information out there and having that waiting period before that decision is made. <clears throat> uh, number four is uh, expanding the way that noticing happens. Um, change of, changes of availability should be noticed through the e-news system, on social media, and in the newspaper. Uh, and then uh, number four, so um, for requests for proposals or bids or sealed bids, um, any method that isn't direct negotiation, um, a, a notice sign should be placed on the property, and this sign would include information about the land disposal process and how the public can submit a proposal or comments. So that would be in addition to number four, if it goes through um, an RFP process as opposed to the direct negotiation. So 
So overall, just kind of trying to expand the way we notice and um, create consistency in the way we're noticing so that we can uh, reach the maximum number of people and have it uh, done the same way throughout, no matter what property it is or who it is that is uh, submitting the letter of interest. Any questions or comments, Tom? Yeah, Kevin, I'm glad you uh, mentioned, uh, except for when it's direct negotiation. I know we try to stay away from direct negotiations, but oftentimes is appropriate, in which case it should be in the code that this notification is not necessary. Um, and also, um, you know, regarding direct negotiations, if somebody digs out a property from boondocks that's been sitting there forever, goes through the effort to develop a plan and submit a proposal, I have problems with just disseminating that to the public um, free of charge. You know, I think if they're willing to put the effort into it, they should be they should be given some deference. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I guess I got several several thoughts along this. Uh, anybody who's heard me up here before has, has always heard that me say that uh, it's all available for sale in, in my book. Uh, if somebody has a good proposal for any piece of land, I don't care what the amount is, I'm going to consider it as a council member. So uh, we'll start with that. Um, but I think when we get in trouble or any time we've had issues here, it has been with the direct negotiation. Um, I understand that there are times when that makes sense uh, to do direct negotiations, but I think it's even more important if we're going to consider direct negotiations that we make sure that that is advertised and noticed to the to the neighborhood um, that we're considering that, that direct negotiation. Because that's the only time we've ever gotten in trouble up here. When we've gone out for RFPs, you know, the RFP process, it gets it put in the paper, it gets advertised that there's RFPs, and, and people get the word that they're, that we're considering selling this piece of property. But, uh, but when we, you know, somebody comes up and we move something in, in one night from not available to available and then direct negotiate, that's, uh, that's a shocker to a lot of people, and especially to a neighbor that might have been on that property for, for some time and, and seeing it as not available. So I think we need to advertise for all of them and not, that notification, and I, don't, I think we should be consistent with that 300 feet or 300 yards or whatever that number is that's in, in other parts of the code. I think that's the notification that we ought to use. And we need to notify whether, no matter what we're considering. The other problem I have, which is along the lines of what Tom said is, is you know, uh, the step that we have in our process that requires somebody that puts a letter of interest in to give their plans for what they're going to do with that property just with their letter of interest. Because then that gets out to the public and, um, you know, John sees that I'm going to build a motel here and, you know, and, and we put it out for proposals, and then, you know, the, the, their their hand has been shown. Um, so I think that we, for a letter of interest, unless there's a compelling, compelling argument for for direct negotiations, that that, that uh, initial request should simply be that I'm interested in purchasing this property. Uh, that's available or not available, or whatever the status is on, on the maps, and, and um, let it go at that. Because 99 times out of 100, we're going to say, put that out for proposals. Um, and then that person's hand has already been shown. Um, again, there are times when direct negotiation, and I suppose if, if you, I don't think it should be required, I guess. If they want to put that in their proposal, 
that they're interested in this land and this <coughs> they plan on doing it and they'd love us to direct negotiate with them then, then that's on them but right now we're requiring them one of the things that they have to put in their proposal is what they plan on doing with it and I just think that's that's not good for for the public so um, anyway those are my initial thoughts on all of that so Councilman Gard. Um, there are arguments for and against um, putting in what you're proposing to do with the property because we've got our tiered point system for what is it going to be used for, what benefits is it going to be to the community, and it's not, it hasn't always been the high dollar bid that was the best for the community, so how deep we want to go into restructuring this whole thing because if we if we get rid of that then our well let, let, let me clarify maybe if I could I'm not talking about after we put out it for RFPs and when they put in the proposal if they if we've asked for RFPs then that RFP needs to have all those things that you're going to point it on and they, everything needs to be laid out but in this initial letter that says I'm interested in this property and now I want the Planning Commission to make a recommendation to council on that, whether or not we should direct negotiate, whether we should put out for our RFPs, whether we should bid uh, or hold a public auction. Um, that step, we're making, we're playing poker with somebody and we're, we're making them show their hand while we get to hide our cards. And like I said, you know, 99 times out of 100, we're going to put it out for our RFPs. There is that one case where we're, we're not and we're going to direct negotiate. And I don't think that should ever be done in one night. I think that there, there needs to be a notification period. But uh, uh, as far as that initial letter, uh, we're, we're putting people at a, as a, at a disadvantage for telling us what, they, what they'd like to use a piece of property for. Just my thought. I agree. We're making advance on twice. Speak into the mic. They're not going to hear you. You need to hear it again. Uh, it's not me. <laughs> it's the people on the phone. I agree with what uh, Councilman Allison said. So, the way you're envisioning, if somebody puts in a letter of interest, then all that does is pull the trigger on setting up a request for proposals from the community. Correct. And the planning commission could decide. If the planning could, commission. Planning commission could decide, you know, this property, we really need this property for a, the snow dump, or we really need this property for the for a future police department or fire hall, then they can say, we're going to recommend the case. They, they're going to forward the council either way. But they could say, you know, we're, we're saying council that no, there are plans for this property. We, we're not going to do it. Or they're going to pass it on and say, yeah, the you know, city doesn't have any use for this property. I think we should put it out for our piece. And, and that triggers the notice. And that triggers period. notification and, and all of that. So and on, and on the notice <laughs> section, on section four, do we want to put in there that <clears throat> The notification goes out by letter to the registered property owners of any property within 300 feet. Or? I think I think it should be should be a, a written notification. Then there's no there's no whining about not yeah. a next door neighbor not getting not knowing about it. So if we do this, are we going to have any? If, if we codify that, are we going to get into any trouble with notification? If we say we have to notify somebody and we don't. You know, we have a hard time getting a letter to them, or is there any way we want to write that so we don't get hung out the dry at some point in time? Okay, I've got Councilman Bale, or Commission Yeah, I, I believe it's legit to do electronic notifications as well. You can send a letter if they're out of town and not picking up their mail. Most people check their email, and I think that's legit in code. But do we have emails, addresses for all? Uh, 
Um, I mean, it'd be off our property tax list would be my guess is where we're getting these addresses from. Yeah, I don't know that. Um, I don't know that. Well, I mean, we have plenty of rules in code about having to notify people, so this wouldn't be onerous on us to add this in, I don't think. But it's an easy deal to do, is what you're saying. Easy enough, okay. yeah. That's all my words. Yeah, I'm Mr. sure. Bannon. Yeah, um, I, I don't think uh, 300 feet is, uh, you know, I think it needs to be further than 300 feet. Because 300 feet could be, let's say your lot's 300 feet, doesn't even make it over to the next, next yeah. lot or something. It needs to be a substantial distance, I think, like in the neighborhood area somehow. But I, I don't believe 300 is uh, enough distance. And then I agree with, with uh, Councilman Allison on uh, that number five or I got. Uh, I, I agree. Uh, 300, 300 feet is real short. Um, I would think of 300 yards or so. I, you know, I, yeah. I, I don't. I don't know the magic number. But um, and then uh, another comment that I was going to say, <clears throat> not to be too much off topic, but um, a lot of the younger people and uh, people who don't follow. Uh, any of our activities uh, don't know about uh, requesting, you know, for property that, that everything is available if you put in a request for it. A lot of people are kind of blown away that that's even a thing. So I don't know if that's something that we could include with this when there is a notification that properties are available if you request or something along them lines. I, I just, it, it's not known to a lot of people from what I've seen. Councilman Meyer. Yeah, um, I agree with a, a lot of what you said. I think the main thing that I thought in comment is about notice. And I think that's something that we've uh, struggled with in the past with how to properly, I think we have our way to notify, but the more notifications we can get out to the public, I think the better on everybody who's watching what city council is doing every meeting for let alone planning and zoning. So um, I think that this is a good um, path for going down. One thing that I would like to see, and I think it would be beneficial to the public, is some kind of flow map of how we go about this process. I think it'd be helpful for us on each board and also for somebody in the public that is interested in looking at um, the process. I think there's a lot of meetings. <laughs> if somebody is interested in a property and it's probably their first time writing a letter of interest and, and showing up to planning and zoning and go through that process and then go to council and then we most of the time go back to RFP. And I, I just think that it's a nerve-wracking experience for somebody who hasn't been through that process trying to figure it out. So I think the more information they can get up, up front um, and we have a clear avenue that has some, some dates in there. Uh, I think that if somebody sent a letter of interest in, they should know that it planning commission meets once a month and you know hopefully you can get on that agenda if you have it in on time and councils every two weeks. And we have certain deadlines for ours um, and we can get it in there. And, um, I think a flow chart is some kind of uh, way to help the expectations of the public or whoever it is that has interest go a long way as well. Um, so that was one of my initial thoughts. And the other one was about the land disposal that happens annually for the updating the map. And I think that would be a really good opportunity to do some outreach to the community, um, maybe do a presentation about the process for land disposal, have it be kind of a town hall or session um, open maybe a little bit more to get community involvement about commenting about city property in general, um, about the disposal process, where they think maybe most use the city building, um, certain lands, what their best use to be, I think we can get a lot of information and um, community input, kind of doing it as an annual thing and lining it up with our um, strategic planning and uh, housing is a big one. I mean, <laughs> I think that's why it'd be good to include the process because 
we need to identify some lots that are really good for housing. And I think that's a priority that should be really high up on our list is housing for Greta. Thanks. Also online, Anne, do you have any comments? All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. My connection is going in and out, so I've been just trying to keep up and put all the pieces together. Um, so just what I understand, what we're discussing is that someone would submit that they want to purchase or lease city property. And then without knowing exactly what they intend to do with that property, we would decide on the disposal method, um, which we usually do try to go with the request for proposals. But I guess I just don't understand how we make that decision absent any information. Well, let me summarize and see if I get it right. So I think we were talking about the letter of interest could come in and, oh, um, as it says in code, a person may submit a letter of interest to the city raising an interest in the purchase of lease or city property. Except as otherwise provided in this chapter, a letter of interest shall be submitted to the city manager and must include the following information. So the name of the interested party and any other names under which the party does business the interested party's mailing address and the address of the interested party's registered office in the state, if applicable. The use or purpose for which the interested party proposes to lease or purchase the property and any additional information required by the city manager, school board, city planner, or the planning commission. And I think number three is where we're kind of saying they may just submit a letter of interest with the components of one and two, and that begins the 30-day notification process um, that we're discussing here. So that that piece was labeled as unavailable or available, that would start planning on that track. Um, there would also be then the notifications on to the neighbors. There'd be the 30-day period. There'd be the review, and then then there would be discussion after that. I'm like, correct, council. Right. My understanding, Ms. Mayor, is that's right, except for available properties that are already listed on our maps have already been given the 30-day notice period, so they wouldn't have to go through for the property itself. It would apply. We could go through with it. Um, um, yeah, except for except for when an RFP is is decided that you are going to do an RFP, but um, the initial noticing um, is if it's going from unavailable to available because people think, oh, this isn't available, I don't need to okay. think about it, and then all of a sudden it becomes available. Whereas if something's been available for ten years, why? I guess the commission's collective thought was. Why does everyone need to know that someone's putting a proposal in necessarily at that time? Because they've had their chance to put it in because it's been available. Mm -hmm. okay. And I guess just to, to further explain my understanding of the reason that we came up with this available, not available maps are to try to let people hone in more on those properties that aren't needed for sure by the city for snow removal or whatever purpose that they, the ones that are listed as not available generally have some reason and while it's still true that we, someone can come in and, and say we would like to take this property and then we can consider it and council can consider it um, and so as Councilmember Allison said pretty much everything is available and that's the process that we've been going by but we're trying to hone the process to a place where it is fair to everybody and the available properties have already been noticed for a long time generally um, what happened to us last spring was that a property came up that had been listed as unavailable and it was only 30 days 60 days at most after we had just published our new maps for the year and we went through the process and said okay sure it's available we can 
and change it. You miss this one. It's not needed for snow removal. And then property owners, adjacent property owners, got upset because we didn't give them a 30-day period or some kind of notification period. So um, that explains a little bit more why why this is come about. And to me, anyway, that's my feeling of why it's come about. That's my turn. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. You yeah, keep nice. talking about going out for an RFP on this. And I know that there are properties, um, we did a half lot a year or two ago that wasn't adjoining any other property besides the one next to it. And something like that is obviously appropriate to go into direct negotiations for, but do we need to codify anything? Just if we want to do RFPs for stuff that we have a way instead of just talking between ourselves and then the council changes and the commission changes and all this stuff we've done gets forgotten. I mean, do we want to make that our first and best or are we making something too onerous by trying to do this? Or Because a general person's agreement here between all of us goes away when we all go away. I think that's why we're asking for the whether we should what we should put into code and try it we're trying to balance between not putting too much into code sort of like changing our bylaws no no and I make understand. them too onerous and for the future the but at the same time making it so that the memory bank does continue well, no I understand so. but that's what I'm saying how do we if we wanted to codify it how do we codify it? A delineation between RFP or direct negotiations or competitive bid or whatever we want to do. I mean, if, if we're gearing all this, the discussion now has been all towards RFP. I have Councilman Gleason and then Commissioner. So we agreed ourselves already that RFP was what we were going to do and we were going to do it for everybody so that it's the same all the time. And we did change a few things. I mean, we did some stuff the other way before that, and it kind of, we got, we had some unhappy people. Oh, I understand. So, and then recently, we went to direct negotiation on one thing because we made a mistake in that process, and it, oh, we had to fix that. it. So, but whatever we do, it has to be the same for everybody. An RFP is the easy way to ensure that Everybody has a chance to bid on a piece of property. More than likely, the guy that puts in the proposal is going to get it, you know. But there are circumstances where there's adjoining properties and a piece of land here, and this guy might not want somebody to do something with this land. So he has a chance to do it. The city is going to take whatever is best for the city, right? They're going to put in their proposals. And so I, I think RFP is the way to go, and we just make it that way all the time, unless there's extenuating circumstances. But how do you codify that? What's up to Commissioner Bannon? Somebody else. So you know, there is a reason to have the direct negotiation, and we used it twice, and you guys used it after our, which was the machine shop and in the science center. Mm -hmm. Those were both not available properties. The only reason they got made available was because the machine shop was a strategic thing that could be used for Cordova and fit that area. We're fishermen, we'll be good at the town, we we'll good at the city. That would have not been made available, it would have been kept in the harbor for Tony to use. Same thing with the science center. They've been looking for a good piece of property by the ocean, and that was the reason. So there is reason. You can't just go, oh, we're going to do RFP every time. So there's a reason for direct negotiation. Is it all the time? Probably not. It just happened to be two times in the last two, three years here, though, that it did get used. Oh, I understand, but I'm just saying, how do we write it's your it mic, down? Jeff, your mic. Oh. My question is still, how do we codify this 
to leave ourselves the flexibility that we like. I think it's already codified. Uh, we've got our options in there. Is this, if, if we took out requirement number three for a detailed proposal on that first round, then just like wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, we're, I'm not saying they can't put in a full proposal. I'm just saying it's not going to be required. And then that first round, when it comes to the Planning Commission, if it's just a simple letter that says I'm interested in this property, then that's all they're really considering. They're going to forward it to council and say that, that decision's easy. It's we're either not selling it at all or we're going to put it out for our fees. But if I have a good enough proposal that I think I can get them to, to decide on direct negotiations because I'm going to, you know, I'm going to expand the, I need that tidelands over there to, to expand the shipyard and, and I've got the resources and the money to do it and and uh, that's what I want to do with that property, so I need you to lease and then sell me that property after I get it built, um, then, then I can put that in my proposal, in my initial letter, and then the Planning Commission can then decide, well, yeah, that's, that's what the city needs. We need to go ahead and direct negotiate that. And then we can put it to council, and we can, we can do the next steps. It's already codified. We just take that step three out of codification as far as, as a requirement to produce that. The, it's already coded that the Planning Commission and the Council have the ability to direct negotiate. We have the ability to public auction it. We have the ability to put it out for RFPs. That's already codified. That we don't need to mess with all of that. I'm just, I think, anyway, I don't know if that makes sense to everybody, but I, all I think we got to change in the code is is that number three and put in some requirements for notification of adjacent property owners whether we use 300 yards three miles three feet whatever whatever we're going to use um, um, I think staff can come up with a, a number that makes sense that matches other code and uh, and brings forth some changes to code for that but I think as far as whether it goes to RFP or direct negotiation, that's already part of code. Council, Council Commissioner Word. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess just to clarify, perhaps people aren't looking at page two of the handout that has existing code, and it does show that there is a, a section B at the top of the next page um, that describes how um, the city council shall select the method by which to conduct disposal, and it offers the four options. And from what, I mean, to, to respond to Councilmember Glason's comments, I, I guess I would not want to see us codify that it has to be by RFP. I think council members need to have discretion at, in particular instances, but yeah, I think that if it's just demonstrated by the history and by the method that council members um, take these uh, proposals or letters of intent and then decide, okay, most unless there seems to be some you know really extenuating circumstance, we generally do this in, by an RFP process that is in the best interest of the city. But I think council should have the, the ability to to do it differently, and what you should rely on the planning commission to look at that further and give you some recommendations. Um, but you can decide that I mean, we have the same, you know, we go by the same process basically. And um, so I, you know, I think that that what we're suggesting is that we wanted more discussion from you so you understand the process we try to go through where we look at the whole city maps once a year. We notice that meeting. We've had some participation sometimes and we'll try to do a better job. I really like the idea of developing a flow chart of the whole process and advertising that more widely to folks. But, you know, I think a lot of people just walk into the planner's office and say, hey, how, how can I buy some property in town? What's available? And then it's his job to 
explain that process to folks, but we can try to advertise it better, and then we can go through this process of trying to make sure we do notice properties for at least 30 days that aren't listed as available already, so that by the time it gets to you for, that, for some kind of a decision, the property should have already been uh, talked about or whatever, and make your jobs a little easier, but we can, in terms of deciding what's in the best interest of the city and what process to go through. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, hey, Commissioner McGann first. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with what Nancy just said, and I just want to remind us all of the most recent land disposal with the hangers. Could you use your mic? Sorry. Um, I'd like to just remind us all about the most recent land disposal with Eva and Kim Hager. I mean, that was something that council agreed was pretty straight up direct negotiation. Um, doesn't make any sense to put it the mandate that that would go for an RFP. Thank you. Councilman. So I guess yes, I must have been, I must have misspoke. I didn't, I'm not trying to change anything. And I referred to the most recent transaction there where we did go to direct negotiate because we made a mistake. In extenuating circumstances, we're gonna have to do that. But most of our transactions are gonna be uh, to our that's the fairest way to do it. That way, it doesn't come back on us and they say, hey, you sold it to that guy and I wanted that for 10 years, you know. And we recently had an outburst in one of our meetings over that exact thing. So, all I'm saying is RFP is probably what's gonna get used the most. There's gonna be a few times where we go into direct negotiation and they're gonna be completely different situations. So RFP is, is what we've been doing, and just like Jeff said, our seats are all gonna change and somebody else might wanna do something else. I have no idea. But that's, I like the RFP process, but yes, I agree, and not for every circumstance, but it's gonna be for probably 99% of them. So, that's what I was saying. I, I didn't mean I want to try to change code um, or stop direct negotiation because it does have its place. Any other discussion? Go ahead. I just guess a uh, clarification for uh, planning and zoning. Um, on one hand, I agree with not uh, putting out your uh, your game plan with your request for you know with your uh, request to you know purchase or lease property. Um, does that mean that commission just forwards on every every request, or do we do we have a deciding factor on whether or not we make that property available or not? Um, I, I'm just I. I'm a little confused about that. If, if if they don't give us a reason why they want the property, are we just to decide to, to, to decide that everything makes it to council and without reason, or? Councilman Ellison, then I got you, Tom. Yeah, everything goes to council, no matter what your recommendation or no recommendation is. It, it's After that first initial letter, it's still gonna come to council. But I guess the way I envision it is if, if I'm interested in the police property and there's no compelling reason for it for me to say that I'm gonna build a hotel here, then I don't have to say that in my first letter. I just take right. and then it's the planning commission's job to say, okay, this is on the list as available, we wanna sell it, forward it to council with a recommendation to put it out for RFPs. But if it is, you know, if I do think that's compelling enough, to then you've got to consider whether or not is that is that a compelling reason or not? Right. And it, may, it might be that you see that the lots unavailable, and 
I might not know the reason why, and it might not be clear on the map why that's unavailable. Then I think it would be the planning commission's job to say, no, that's that's unavailable because the city uses that for our impound lot, or the city uses that for this, and we don't have any other place to, to put the to put the sewer treatment plant. So it's it's got to stay there, and, and that's where it's going to be. So we were forward that to council and say, council, we recommend that we keep this because of this. We can't put it out for sale. But that's the way I envision the, yeah. the planning commission. That first, that first decision, the very first time you see it, should 99 times out of 100 be be easy. Yeah. You know, we, it's for sale or not. <laughs> if, the, if it's not, then a reason why. If it is for sale and it's listed as for sale, then then order the council and say let's sell it. Uh, and we're gonna, you know, like you said, 99 times out of 100, we're gonna say. Okay, let's put it off for RFPs. Yeah. yeah, no, makes sense. I just wanted clarification. Thank you. Commissioner McGann. I don't have anything to add. Okay. Thank okay. you. Anyone on the phone? And I see the city manager. Yeah, Melina. Okay, go ahead, Melina, and then we'll let Helen take a turn. Okay, um, I guess just one thing that's been popping up in my head when we've been talking about. You know, sometimes when we go into direct negotiations, um, it doesn't necessarily mean a sale is going to happen. I know I've been on council a couple times when we have gone into direct negotiations and nothing has actually, the property was never sold because, and from my understanding too, a lot of times is a lot of the process of really digging into what it would take to develop that land, to complete the products they are, is there's a lot of man hours into doing some of that, that lake work and some of that doesn't really happen until direct negotiation or we, you know, we open it up to allow some of that more investigative work for breaking that and trying to get the property um, and get it to a sale, whether it's negotiating the price, looking at it, and knowing how much work is involved into it. So I don't know that our process is completely broken in a lot of ways. I do really rely on the planning and zoning, what their recommendation is, because I think that they they know those properties and maybe do a little bit more of the legwork in developing it. And it's, you know, that's kind of our policy to go out to the RFP a little bit more and whether we're not getting as much information up front to um, get that process going. I just, um, I just kind of think a little bit about like what that flow chart looks like, you know, what's the man hours behind.